much, Patricia and everybody. So, hello. 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 Okay, good, good. Stay awake. Um, okay, so some of you, I think I've met most of you now. I knew some of you before. I'm sure I know all of you by the end of this trip, but my, my name's Hugh Newman. Um, I'm really a megalithic researcher. That's my kind of main focus. Uh, also, uh, I've written a book about giants, strange subject, but it's something we're actually going to get into today with my co-author Jim Vieira. Recently published Stone Circles, one of the wooden books. I've got a couple here as well. And uh, my earlier work is about earth grids and sacred sites around the planet. I've been involved in a couple of TV shows, the infamous Ancient Aliens. Okay. And um, Search for the Lost Giants, which was just a six-part series on History Channel with Jim and Bill Vieira. And uh, there's a few more projects in the making, but uh, not any news on that just yet. I'm also got this other book coming out. Uh, this is just a, I've got my one of my books features in this larger volume. Um, again, published by Wooden Books, which is coming out on the summer solstice this year. And uh, we're going to be doing a little book launch at Stonehenge on the summer solstice. But I organise since 2006 with John Martin, John Martin, who is my publisher, and Gareth Mills. We've been running the Megalithomania Conference in Glastonbury. And this is really what, you know, it's really opened up the door for a lot of researchers to get their information out there. We kind of mix the academic with the alternative. We have some very, very interesting people who've spoken there. Patricia and Youssef were there last year. Andrew speaking this year. He actually, he actually spoke at the first one back in 2006. But people like Graham Hancock, Robert Bouvard, and many, many other people who've uh, been involved. And uh, we're very proud of it, and we kind of, you know, continue doing it. It's a kind of labor of love. And we also, you know, we run, because it's based in Glastonbury, we run lots of little tours, like to private access to Stonehenge, and other such things around the conference. You can actually come over and hang out in Glastonbury for almost a week, and uh, get, get the full megalithic effect in England. Those in America, there's a couple of uh, events I'm speaking at uh, with some of the other uh, people here. Contact in the Desert, uh, which is the famous um, sort of UFO ancient alien conference. First time I'll be speaking there actually, that's the first few days of June. And then in October, I'm speaking at the ARE conference. This is in Virginia Beach, and this is the Ed Casey Foundation, which Andrew's been involved with for a very long time. I'll be there with Freddie Silva and others. But I actually live right next door to Stonehenge. This is actually my house. Um, where I live. It's actually the address is, oh, don't tell anyone. Yeah. It's uh, number one Stonehenge Cottages, Stonehenge. So it's one of the best addresses, I think, in England. So, um, and I'm also involved with these people. They're, they're, they're like the campaigner druids, if you like. And these actually were protecting Stonehenge. And actually, you know, support them and I give money to them, I give percentages and profits to them because there's a huge tunnel being built uh, around the whole landscape and it's going to really damage the landscape potentially and even damage the archaeology which is buried deep in the ground there. Um, and so whatever we do in England, we kind of give to them and support them as well. And, uh, and you, can, you know, they come and hang out at my house because I'm literally a 10 minute walk from the stones myself. Um, but I've been, you know, living in that area it's also the area of crop circles. Any of you interested in the crop circles? Yeah. Any of you been in any? Yeah. A few of you, yeah, yeah. Because every year I go out with my kind of uh, my jetpack, no, no, sorry, my drone, and um, kind of film as many crop circles as I can. And we do, we're running a little event this summer. We're going to go and look at some crop circles and some megaliths all together, based right near my home. Some, you know, a couple of us are going to stay in my house. We've got a hotel reserved as well. But it's just very, you know, I think it's very important to actually um, get out and see these sites for yourself. Sorry, one second. Let's just get this straight here. Anyway, this is where we are. We're in ancient Egypt. This is one of the most important places from a megalithic perspective on the planet. Now, I've been coming here since 2010. I uh, came here first actually on a tour we organised with Robert Bouval, um, which is a huge amount of fun actually, it's an amazing, amazing guy to spend a couple of weeks with. Uh, but the location of Giza is something that fascinates me with my earth grids research. Now, the, you know, people in England there's a tradition of ting and moot sites or the you know, Greek vision, the omphalos and things like this, where you try and find the center 
of your culture or the centre of your landmass. But with e Egypt and the Giza Plateau, it's really the centre of the world. It's like it's taking the whole world into account and it's the Earth's axis mundi. I think a lot of you are probably aware of this. The Great Pyramid has so many secrets, so much knowledge and wisdom and math mathematics and geometry encoded within it. But it's also the location is very, very important because not only um, do we have it's at the centre really of the world's landmass if you place it harmonically like this onto a map. And this was noted by Napoleon and his surveyors. It was noted by Charles Piazzi Smythe when they were surveying this area and they were trying to choose the prime meridian. Giza was put forward as the modern prime meridian of the planet because of this back in the late 1800s. But eventually, for political reasons, um, Greenwich and England got chosen and it didn't, doesn't really make sense because when you start looking at other sites around the world, you'll soon see that in fact they're harmonically connected with Giza. Giza really is the centre point. This is actually a graphic um, that we got permission to use in the Earthquakes book from Graham Hancock, uh, from his book Heaven's Mirror. And it clearly shows you some of the harmonic distances and the numbers. And we're looking at you know the, the same number systems we find in Procession, we find in angles of pentagons and things like this encoded within distances between sites around the world from Giza. So this, this is very important because it seems like it was like placed as like a sort of almost like a plug point for the planet. And it was chosen specifically, no, not just for that reason, but that's one of the reasons. And all the Earth Grid research connects with this as well. And there's some examples here. Um, you know, like Tiwanaku, for instance, is quite interesting. It's 100 degrees west. The Great Pyramid, Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Um, we've got Angkor Wat, uh, which is, I believe, I've, I've got the list actually on the next page here. Yeah, here's some other ones here. So, like, the Easter Island is 140 degrees west. Um, Quito, uh, the Ecuadorian Inca site, is 110 degrees west, and so on and so forth. And we find this throughout the world. Here's just uh, more examples that show some interesting numbers here. Angkor Wat is 72 degrees east. Oh, you got one of those. Thank you, sir. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So this just shows you some examples. I'm not going to go into all this now, but it just shows you some examples of why Giza was chosen as the prime meridian in the prehistoric world. And everything kind of came from there. There might have been another prime meridian before that, though, which we'll look at in a moment. But you know, the Great Pyramid itself is really a representation of the Northern Hemisphere of the planet. This is something Andrew's going to be mentioning a bit later in his lecture, so I'm not going to go into it right now. But it sits within two kilometres of 30 degrees latitude, um, which is very, very interesting. The height and perimeter of the Great Pyramid, multiplied by 43,200, a harmonic number, uh, reveals uh, the modern polar radius and equatorial circumference of the Earth. And you know, this number is a very important number in anything to do with metrology. And the base length of the Great Pyramid is one eighth of a minute of degree of the planet. A minute is one sixtieth of a degree. So we're seeing that just, you know, looking at it in a broad sense, the pyramid already encodes many secrets. Also, the prime meridian was noted in some very early maps, although they used Alexandria rather than uh, Giza as prime meridian when these maps were being put together by, by um, Admiral Pyrrhus Res in the 1500s and Arontius Finicus as well. Um, and because Alexandria was the place of learning, you know, going back that, you know, a couple of thousand years. Uh, but they realised when they analysed these maps, the work of Charles Hapgood, um, and also Albert Einstein was very interested in this, they realised that much of the world had been mapped at that time and Egypt was the centre point of all this, whether it was Alexandria or Giza. It was probably originally Giza but they shifted it to Alexandria because that was the place of learning around the world. There's connections with Baalbek as well, um, you know, directly. We know that the boats that are buried on the Giza plateau are made from cedar wood from Lebanon, not too far from Baalbek itself. Um, we also know the megalithic construction type stonework is very, very similar. Um, but this, this I find particularly interesting. This was uh, discovered by Alex Whitaker of ancientwisdom.co.uk. Um, and it sits 
Baalbek sits five degrees east of Giza and four degrees north, suggesting again, like a grid system, it was part of a great survey in antiquity. And we also have this king, which Yusef will correct me on the pronunciation, Kazakh Humi. Hmm? What's, what's, the, what's this king's name? <laughs> <laughs> so it translates as from, yeah, according to you, sir. <laughs> Is it the one from the second list? Yeah, Kas Moy. That one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to say. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, later maybe. Later. <laughs> uh, but this, this, this gentleman's very interesting. We're going to talk a bit about him later when I get into the giants of ancient Egypt because a statue of him was found at Byblos, the ancient Lebanese capital. And this, he dates to around 2700 to 2900 BC. It's so almost very beginning point of the first dynasty, just uh, although he was uh, within the second dynasty. And he was supposed to be extremely tall, more details on later, but why was his statue found at this particular site with a direct connection with ancient Egypt? We'll get more into that shortly, we'll have a little chat, we'll, have, we'll talk about him because he's a very interesting chap. But there's other connections with Egypt, just want to throw a few examples at you. These are the Newark earthworks in um, uh, Ohio, I've been here a couple of times. These are absolutely huge. This is like, I mean, the Great Pyramid could sit in here about four times. It's absolutely massive. But one of the things people don't realize about the earthworks of ancient North America is their incredible sophistication and construction, even though they were just using earth and chalk and different materials and clay and things like this. The exact orientation, if you direct it exactly 6,000 miles, it hits the Great Pyramid which is, we've tested this, we've double checked this, um, and it just, it just works. And this is just one of many examples that we find connections around the world. This is actually what the earthworks look like now. Fortunately, they've got a golf course within the earthworks, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it very confusing, uh, even now, but imagine what it's like in a, a thousand years. It just shows you a more close up of that. But the earthworks here are just fascinating. This is an area of research where we find we've got over 1,500 accounts of giant skeletons in North America. And it's more earthworks similar to this. These have been found in the Amazon, uh, Brazilian Amazon and um, other parts. But one of the things that grabbed my attention was the fact that some of the geometries of these match the geometries not only of the earthworks in North America, but also some of the stone circles of England. This is actually a flattened B, which is a type of uh, stone circle geometry that was uh, rediscovered by Alexander Tong in the 1950s and 60s. We'll, get, uh, we'll talk more about that later. There's other connections here. This is an interesting one from Newgrange to Giza. You know, Newgrange is like a major um, winter solstice aligned megalithic chamber, goes back at least 3,500 BC. Um, if you draw a line directly between them, that distance is exactly one tenth of the planetary circumference. Exactly, you know, or, or, weirdly exactly. And there's, there's more and more of these which I feature in the Earth Grids book. We also have some interesting um, anomalies with Luxor and, um, and Giza and Avebury. Luxor and Avebury are kind of a seven, there's seven sites. They're like, they have the number seven encoded in their latitude. Um, see here, Giza we've got here obviously, that's at 30 degrees more or less above the equator within two kilometers. And that, if you're doing it all the way around the Earth, you're going to have a six-sided uh, hexagon here. I think that's correct. And uh, here we have, if we look at the locations, the latitudes of Avebury and Luxor, if we divide this quadrant here into seven, Luxor is two-sevenths up from the equator, and Avebury is four-sevenths up, no sorry, is it And actually, Avebury is the seventh of the way around the Earth from the equator. The location, the latitude of that is 360 divided by 7, gives you the exact latitude of that particular site. So we see lots and lots of anomalies when we start looking at the location of these ancient sites. So we go there, we go and enjoy these sites, we look at them, but we don't often think about why they're in that particular spot. Because often they're in obscure places. The Giza Plateau is like just part of a desert near a big river originally. Same with Tiwanaku in Bolivia, it's just in this sort of plateau, it's not anything really to look at, it's not beautiful in any way, but they're specifically chosen because of their locations and also to do with what's going on under the surface as well, with the earth energies, 
in the geology and the underground water. It's another one I kind of, uh, when I was messing around with Google Earth, um, I was looking at any connections with uh, Peru and um, Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey, two of my favorite places on the planet, in fact. And, uh, and I was convinced, because they're both kind of naval sites, they're both like Axis Mundi on phallus sites in their own cultures. We have the Coricantia in Cusco, Peru, and we have obviously Gebekli Tepe in uh, southeast Turkey. They both, you know, it's along with Easter Island and other places around the world, they kind of translate as naval, and you often get these images of the hands on the statues pointing towards the naval. And uh, when I drew a line across the surface here, I noticed it was 7,928 miles. And I immediately recognized that number as being the Earth's diameter. If you cut right through the center of the Earth at the equator, it's 7,928 miles. And, you know, if you look at the work of John Michel, who was my mentor back in England, he's, uh, he worked with these canonical numbers that the ancients used, where he used to sort of average the, average the numbers down if they're within 10 or 20 miles. And he came up with this and he realized that it's actually, that would be, you know, in a canonical sense, it would be 7920 miles, which then becomes the harmonic of 8 times 9 times 10 times 11. So all these distances around the earth were known by the ancient people. And they were encoding them between sites on other sides of the world, potentially. And so this is just the tip of the iceberg. Really. If you want to get into this, um, you need to kind of start studying things like this which is the, the classic Earth Grids map that was developed by William Becker and Beth Hagens back in the 1980s. And you can see here, I mean, I'm not going to do much, too much on the grids here, but just give you a quick introduction. Um, and you can see here, this is Giza here. So that's one of the main points here. And you can see this would be the prime meridian. Go all the way up here. Also got Northern <coughs> Scotland. Interestingly, you can see this bit of uh, South America here see that the way the Earth's mass kind of shapes around these grid points. So is there energy going on here with these as well? We get the same thing in Australia, the Gulf of Carpentaria here. And <coughs> there are other anomalies like here is the um, Bermuda Triangle area. We've got uh, Hawaii. Easter Island down here, Hawaii here, so on and so forth. And there's lots of anomalies. In fact, I'm going to be speaking about this strange anomalies around the world in, a, in an upcoming edition of Ancient Aliens who are doing a thing about this, about portals and strange anomalies and sites around the world. And this is uh, you know, a Google map version of where this line would go. And interestingly, the alignment from Giza down to the south part here of South Africa fits very neatly into the grid, very neatly. You know, and it fits inside the face of uh, this triangle, this um, uh, octahedron surface as well. And this white line here is also very interesting, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, it's actually a great earth circle with many, many major sites connected on that. We'll look at that in a moment. But the great earth circles were another anomaly where all the way around the earth, we've got exactly the fight divides the planet in two, like a hoop around the earth. We have to get many sites connecting, which again could suggest an ancient um, survey of the earth. We've got here, this is interesting here, because connection with Delphi, Giza, Mecca, and the Serpent Mound in Ohio. But the reason this is interesting, this alignment was, wasn't discovered by chance, just randomly creating a line around the world. It was discovered by Robin Heath, who's brilliant researcher, who's going to be speaking at Megalith the Mania. It was this alignment here, continued around the world. And the reason this is important, it was Stonehenge here, Malundi Island here, which actually means elbow, like corner point. He realized that, and this is the quarry site where the blue stones from Stonehenge came from, so there's a, a direct link between these. And this is a 5, 12, 13 Pythagorean triangle in the landscape. Also, he discovered this 3, 4, 5 Pythagorean triangle in the landscape, connected R below, Rickedly D, they're both originally stone circle sites, now flattened stone circle, now a burial chamber, and Stonehenge, with all harmonic distances between them. So he was sort of interested in this, because this, shape here is found inside Stonehenge as well. It's the exact shape, but 2,500 times smaller than the four station stones within Stonehenge. So there's lots and lots to think about when you start looking at this kind of thing. And this is the continuation of this line here around the world. So things just keep popping out when you look at the way the ancients placed these sites. And this one here is interesting. This is the discovered by Jim Allenson. And this takes in Nazca, Machu Picchu, 
to Sali, Siwa, Giza, Ur, Angkor Wat, Easter Island, and other sites all the way around the world, which he believes was the original equator of the planet. But interestingly, if we change the North Pole location to where it could have been, uh, the Hudson Bay area, uh, several, you know, probably 10, 12,000 years ago, because <coughs> of the, uh, the shifts in the Earth crust, which is one of the theories Charles Hapgood put forward. We sort of reset the grid on the old North Pole, where it would have been at least 12,000 years ago or so. That would be here, okay? So this is like everything's just shifted around uh, about 20 or 28 degrees, something like that. And interestingly, this, this one really grabbed my attention, because this line here could have been the original prime meridian, which we're taking Gebekli Tepe, Baalbek and Nabta Playa, these three sites here. Now these are some of the most impressive, especially Quebec, Tepe and Baalbek, megalithic sites on the planet. This is known to be 12,000 years old, or more, or more or less that day. There's different ideas about that. Baalbek could be that old, and Nabta Playa we know is at least 5,000 to 6,000 BC. So the original prime meridian, just, just an idea, can't prove that, could well have been there. But yeah, uh, I'm going to just talk. So that, that's just some a summary of some of the grid, some of the geodesy uh, that connects Giza with some of the other sites around the world. Uh, I want to get now into some other aspects. You know, now we're here in Egypt. We're going to be going here. Obviously, this is the uh, Aswan Quarry, the great um, obelisk that never quite got finished. Potentially, it's 1,168 tons, the estimated weight. Um, there's other there's other things going on in the quarry here, but one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about the quarry of these ancient sites, whether it be Stonehenge, uh, Egypt, Easter Island, anywhere, is that they are specifically chosen, not just for the stone, but for the location where the stone came. It's like the birthplace of the temple. So they, they revere the quarry as though it's a sacred site within itself. So there's sometimes there's geodetic connections with the quarry and where the <coughs> site is then placed. Um, and this is one example which kind of caught my attention when I did a bit of research on this. What I found was, is that if you draw a line from the exact centre of the obelisk to Giza, to basically the Great Pyramid of course, it's, uh, the distance is exactly 365.4 nautical miles, which are the number of days in a year. Nautical miles are the, you know, the exact, it's what, you know, it's what um, uh, navigators use and airlines use and things like this. It's probably what the ancients used as well. There's good evidence <coughs> for that. And so that I found really interesting. It could be an anomaly, it could be a coincidence, but when you look at where the stones from Stonehenge came, the Bluestone Quarry in Wales, and you realise that that is part of a system as well. And then I started looking at other places and they kind of all fit into this thing. We also have this as well. This is um, an experiment to measure the size of the earth um, back in around 200 BC um, by this guy here, Eratos Thinis. He calculated the polar circumference uh, very close to what it should be by noting the angle of the midday midsummer shadow, mid shadow at Alexandria. He knew that Cyan, 500 miles to the south, uh, it would cast no shadow, so he worked out that with uh, the angle of seven degrees shadow, um, or one fiftieth of three hundred and sixty, so fifty times five hundred miles, gave him twenty-five thousand miles as the circumference of the Earth. That's within just a, you know, it's very very close. Just by working it out with shadows and tall things like obelisks, they were able to understand and work out exactly what was going on, the size and shape of the Earth. Time science was very well developed here, even more so in Mexico, obviously. Um, so just, you know, these things were happening, and they, they had a very, very sophisticated understanding of the planet in prehistory. And then we have the, the famous diorite pounders, which made all the pyramids um, in Egypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, uh, Yusuf's already talked about this, obviously. Um, I just want to note, note you know, some anomalies here. These. Um, these kind of shapes here, these striations and chippings that we'll see in a, in a couple of days. But one thing, I just found this online, I don't, I don't know sure exactly who this is, but I don't know if you know anything about this use of Patricia, but some massive diorite powders were found as well, not just standard sized ones for normal sized humans, some giant ones. Have you seen these before? Ones I've seen this the big? pictures, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll get onto giant soon, but you know, it's a good <laughs> 
And then obviously we've got, uh, this, this, again, these are the striations. We have as one small photos because it keeps good shadows. This is from Oyente Tambo. It's from as one Oyente Tambo is obviously in Peru. We'll have a look at that all in a moment. But the same kind of things we see at Machu Picchu. This was actually taken in June uh, 2015. I was there with Andrew uh, Bryant. And you can't really see this at other times of year. I can't, I've never seen this when I go there in November because the sun never hits it at the right time. But you get these kind of same, similar striations, a little bit different but here and here as well. And this is the outer wall of the um, Temple of the Three Windows. Mm -hmm. And also we have this from Oyate Tambo. You can see the striations here again. So it looks like they're scooping it out with ice cream scoops and just uh, softening the stone. And amazingly, it's a Stonehenge as well. Now this isn't the best photo because it's uh, been raining. It does that a lot. Uh, this but it's the same thing going on. They're almost identical styles. Now, Stonehenge is unique in England. Don't get me wrong. It's not. There's over a thousand stone circles in the British Isles. But only one Stonehenge. There's nothing else like it. It's completely unique. It's got measurement systems based on Egyptian systems, based on Phoenician systems, the cubits, the rem and the rod, and all these different measurements. It's got style, it's got precision carving, it's got mortise and tenon joints, and it's got incredible astronomy and a whole landscape associated with it. I mean, where I live is literally in the centre, it's like in the centre of the Stonehenge landscape, not in the centre of the stone circle, that would be illegal. Um, but the whole landscape is huge and there's other stone circles being discovered. There's dates going back now 10,000 years. This site was marked 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BC, by three huge wooden posts. It could have been some kind of totem pole, just with 100 yards or so from the site. And these were carbon dates, so they know, and they, they realise now the town that I live next to, Amesbury, is the only continuously occupied town in Britain for 10,000 years. So this was a very important place and it never got deserted. So with this quarry thing, I'm, I'm, you know, we have the same kind of thing going on here at Gebekli Tepe. This is uh, Gebekli Tepe up here. This is one of the T-shaped pillars in the quarry, which is uh, less than a mile away, maybe less than a kilometre even. This is Karahan Tepe. This is another site uh, near there. We, get, we, we go there when we do our, do our trips there. Andrew has managed to persuade the um, the local family to let us go there every time and they, they force us to have tea with them twice <laughs> <laughs> um, and they even provide lunch as well we just you know, they, they don't want anything from you they just want to give 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 they're amazing people honestly bow back so i've written a whole series of articles about quarries and ancient sites because i think there's more to this than we see and you can read them all um you can see my page on ancientorigins.net oh. oh. This was obviously just taken the other day. This is the third pyramid, the Menkure pyramid. Again, we have this amazing stonework. I love this stonework. It's like almost like pillows, aren't they? Like puffy polygonal stonework. Uh, but again, I spot we went at the back of the pyramid and we saw more of these kind of markings and striations. I'm not sure if these are ancient, but they're similar to what we were looking at here. So, you know, was this really done with diorite powders? I don't know. But it does seem like people who did this knew what they were doing. They flattened this area off and they left all this puffy. And then this was completely covered, no doubt, in uh, granite, hopefully. And you have the protrusions, or what non-English people call the knobs, um, and other such things. And so let's have a look at some more polygonal and cyclopean walls, because for some reason these fascinate me. These are just a sort of a thing I've been researching, I've been traveling a lot, looking, looking around the world, <coughs> finding them in the most unusual places. Uh, obviously, this is the uh, same pyramid here. This is Cusco. Anyone know where this is? Okay. Anyone know where this is? Easter Island. Correct. Where? <laughs> this is Easter Island. This is one of this is one of the platforms the Moai would um, would stand on. Now, there's, this is the best polygonal stonework there. Most of it's quite this puffy polygonal, but it's not hugely polygonal like we find in Cusco and Peru. This is actually in Italy. This is along the west coast of Italy. And there's, a, there's about 50 sites that I went to about 20 of them back in 2008. I'm going to be going back there again this year. And again, it's just everywhere. You, if you know where to look, you can find it everywhere. These, these are some of this. is a slightly different style in Cusco. This is actually on the streets of Cusco. These are more kind of standardized, but you get this kind of style also in Egypt. They're not huge, 
but you do get the polygonal thing, you get the serpents as well. And some other examples around the streets of Cusco, the famous 12-sided stone and other different types of stonework, lesser quality above it and so forth. Until you read Sexo Romano, of course, this is like one of the most impressive, weirdest sites on the planet. Um, and it really is quite stunning. Some of these, you know, are in excess of 100 tons, 150 tons maybe. Some people claim they're 400 tons, but like, like, like David Hatch Childress, but I can't confirm that. Um, but it has, you know, quite a strong effect on me whenever I go there. <laughs> and you can see the, the cornering here. This is, you know, we see examples of this in Egypt. We saw it at the Assyrian. We see it in the Valley Temple. We see it on the pyramids. We see the way it connects with the ground and the Kuraish pyramid. And it's just amazing. I mean, And obviously Machu Picchu would get it as well. We've already seen some examples of the striations on the polygonal walls. It's actually a giant uh, account. I managed to sort of throw that in there. And you can just see the polygonal stonework. Which you, don't, you don't actually often get, you know, when you go to Machu Picchu, you don't often get around this side of it, you know, that get this close. But you can, And the sun was just perfect. And you can see what's going on here. It's absolutely stunning. And we know, you know, as Brian and other people have been researching for years, and David Childress and, you know, others, um, this is clearly pre-Inca. It's like, you know, pyramids of the Assyrian possibly more likely would be pre-dynastic in the same principles. But it seems like the same architects or indeed the same influence was in play here as it is in other places around the world. Oyen Tambo, this is an amazing place. This is actually in some ways more impressive than Machu Picchu. And the uh, protrusions, I like to call them, and the polygonal stonework, incredible. And obviously we have the massive keyboard buttons, which just fascinate me. I'm quite pressing them, nothing happens. But, you know, interestingly, at the Assyrian, we were there just the other day. First time I've ever been there where, I've been there a few times, but first time I've been there where this water level has been below here. So you can actually see the same kind of keyboard buttons on the stones at the base here. So that kind of really interests me. I know there's some examples on the walls around the Assyrian as well, but to see them down here, so we had a real treat the other day. I mean, I've, you know, I've been here like what, six, seven times, and I've been in the Assyrian that many times, and I've never seen that. So we, we were, you know, we timed it well. Well done, Patricia, really so excellent work. And like, and that's, this alone was worth a visit for me, just to sort of see that. It's big. Oh, this, this explains something. Uh, but the whole Assyria obviously is an incredible site. We'll have uh, get more into that in a while. Uh, this is my, my co-author and good friend Jim Vieira. This is actually um, at Silistani in Peru. And here's you see the, the massive polygonal kind of stomach. Very obviously we saw this the shot from Easter Island. And the protrusions here, very big ones here. Obviously the round towers, the chulpas of Silistani are very impressive themselves. Again, we see the same, this is more of a neat and tidy kind of stonework with 3D reliefs, which are almost identical to Gebekli Tepe in southeast Turkey. I've actually written an article, uh, you can see on Graham Hancock's website, comparing Gebekli Tepe and the sites in the area to many of the sites in Peru, especially Silistani. <coughs> Uh, and there's so many similarities to question, question the dating of, of these particular sites. Again, this is uh, uh, in Rapa Nui. It's another site in Rapa Nui. I forget the name of this one, but I'm wearing the same t-shirt. Uh, but again, huge, huge blocks, slightly puffy. Again, we get that kind of look as well. <laughs> I think this one, this one was cool. That one's been approved. This is a, di this is a different one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is um, some of the uh, crowd statues. These ones are from this one's from near Tiwanaku, not exactly from <coughs> Tiwanaku itself. This is actually on Easter Island. Here we have some other tiki statues as well. The same kind of what David Hatcher Children's has been researching is called the Quizzo position, the healing position, which is found all around. Uh, that part of the world. Of course, giants have been reported on Easter Island. This is, uh, I didn't realize, this is quite an interesting account. Um, I'm going to feature this in a forthcoming book in more detail. We're actually going there in November to investigate this a bit further to see what's going on here because there are actual reports 
people witnessed live giants there back in the 1500s, much like they did in Patagonia, the southern tip of South America, let's say around the mid 1500s, as they did in North America. There was actually a huge wave of giantology going on in the 1500s. It was like a sort of, it just went crazy for it. Like it, it's kind of like what's been happening in the last few years uh, around the world at the moment. So um, the fact that there were all these supposed live giants even around then is very, very interesting. Again, uh, we're seeing more examples here. This just shows you the comparison of the flattened kind of stonework on Mercurius Pyramid with the puffy, the way they just effortlessly did this. I mean, this is just something special. Obviously, this is in the Valley Temple where we're going to have a look at soon. But like you see, you know, with the, the flattened and the puffy, you see example in other places. This is Kutimbo in Peru, near Lake Titicaca. Again, we have one example of puffy next to the flattened kind of polygonal stone. And here as well we get very interesting 3D kind of relief carvings, very much in the style of Gobekli Tepe. Serpents like we find in Gobekli Tepe as well. And we find them you know, other places all over the world, including Egypt obviously. This shows you the cornering here within the Valley Temple, beautifully done. And the sort of just very slight polygonal stonework there. And this is the, uh, supposedly a skull that uh, someone just sent me a picture of from Egypt. But. And this is uh, the fertility temple next to Lake Titicaca. It's a very interesting little place with these uh, phalluses, it's believed. Some other people suggest they're mushrooms. They look a little bit like psilocybin mushrooms. Could well be. I'm sure they're up to things like that in prehistory. And again, this is the Assyria when it was more flooded with water when I came here uh, a few years ago. Back in, I think this was back in 2010. But with the, sh with the light there, you can see these features on the back wall, which we pointed out while, when we were there as well. Almost look like serpents. There's keyboard buttons. There's other such things. But some of these stones are ridiculous. You know, Yusef was talking about this when we were there, weighing you know at least 100 tons, maybe more, maybe less. Some estimates put them even higher. See, again, you can see these kind of buttons here. This place absolutely fascinates me. This is one of the most unique. This is the, obviously the uh, Flower of Life. Now, did, did, anyone, did you all get down there and have a look at those? Because there's like apparently a 13 of them, I believe. You know, on, on the two sides of the Trilithon. 13 of them. Which is quite impressive just to do one of them on paper. But to do it up here, you know, extremely high up on these massive trilithons is a remarkable feat in itself. More polygonal stonework, this is from Osaka, Japan. This is a much later construction, obviously. This was done, I think, in the 12th or 13th century. And we have one of the stones there, which is 108 tons, which is still impressive whenever it was done. And obviously, we have accounts of giants in this area as well, which we're going to feature in the forthcoming book. Um, Everywhere you go, you seem to find this, and obviously this area is rich in megalithomania. There's dolmens all over the country. There's intricately carved stonework. We're gonna, we're gonna, JJ and I are going to plan a visit there in the near future um, to see what's going on because it is a megalithic, you know, really megalithic country that a lot of people don't know about. Italy. This is one of my favourite places uh, for megaliths. People don't realise how important this place is. The whole west coast. Of Italy is rich in these polygonal and cyclopean walls. People believe it's the Etruscans who were the, pre, the precursor to the Romans, but there's evidence of an earlier culture there called the Pelasgians, and they were a seafaring culture which have been compared to the Phoenicians, but they're around much, much earlier. And they may have even moved around the Mediterranean and even gone across the ocean in prehistoric times because not only do you get polygonal stonework, which is incredibly sophisticated, you get these 3D carvings, these uh, relief carvings, which are evident in other places around the world. You also find this, these uh, beautiful kind of Peru-like doorways, which are found in the potential Etruscan sites, but more likely Pelasgian, uh, north of Rome. Um, and there's many, many sites. I did an extensive trip here uh, back in 2008 and planning another one. But this one here is just 
particularly interesting. Someone's done an excellent bit of graffiti there. That's when I have <laughs> slightly different hair. Um, but there's some, some places there, the entire cities are surrounded by <coughs> cyclopean polygonal walls. No one's interested. No one is interested. The only people who've done anything on this, Gary Billcliff, who's brilliant at research, he's going to be speaking at Megalithomania, and Richard Cassaro, and a couple of others. There's no one else is interested. So either we're mad and we're seeing things, or this is really there. But you get you get this you get something I find fascinating. So, you know you get these cyclopean walls, which are just mega blocks. You get examples like this actually a matching picture, as well as polygonal stonework. You actually get the cyclopean stonework, which is much rougher, huge stones. But somehow they just slice the whole wall like they've just taken a cheese slicer and it's gone, and it's flat. You know, and you find that in many of the sites there. This is another one they've done that with as well. This is an old uh, painting. And this is the one that's uh, an entire city or town is surrounded by these stones. And no one talks about it. You try and ask people you know, the information about it, there's like nothing there, nothing going on. Over on the east, southeast area, the sort of tip of the, the shoe, um, the heel of the shoe. There's dolmens and there's rock cut tombs there as well, but it seems like they're a completely different culture to this western culture. We've got to remember this is the coast next to Sardinia, and this is another very interesting place. I haven't put anything in, I think I've put a couple of slides in, particularly of Sardinia, but there's a huge megalithic culture there. Me and JJ have been there twice, and um, there's actually an ancient aliens uh, episode going to be on Sardinia, which I'm going to be speaking about um, when we get back. and. But both of these areas are just utterly fascinating. Uh, uh, yeah. I did a whole lecture about Sardinia um, that you can actually watch online uh, at Megalithomania last year. Again, giant skeletons. These are only seven feet tall, found in the area. <laughs> these one is 11 feet tall. Oh, sorry, 11 foot four. Now this is interesting though. 11 feet and four inches in length. Italian measure, which is equal to about 10 and a half feet English. <coughs> What's that mean? Do they just claim everything's bigger than it really is. <laughs> I didn't mean anything rude then. It's <laughs> <laughs> your twisted minds. <laughs> and this is just the illustration where they found all these strange hieroglyphics within the tomb as well. And you can see, what's that behind it? Is that a polygonal wall? Is it a connection? Who knows? But just north of Italy, uh, sorry, north of Greece, we have Albania. This is a place called Puke. I don't know if you say it like that. Again, we have these beautiful archways and polygonal stonework. So um, I only got three more hours of these polygonal walls and then I'll move on to another subject. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Delphi Greece. Uh, again, people don't realise there's beautifully shaped and cut stonework there, sliced like a cheese slicer. Absolutely beautiful. There's many other sites there. We're actually going to be we're actually going in uh, next month, me and JJ, to do a bit of research because we've got some leads on some other sites. That we couldn't find any pictures of, but here's some beautiful things. Look at this, this is a place called uh, Paleo Castro. We're going to be going to this site, obviously. And this here, these are massive, you can't really see how big these are, but these are like, you know, that's probably about six foot, or five feet tall, one of the stones. And this is, this is really interesting. This is actually a potential Hittite site in Turkey. It's where we, we, me and Andrew, uh, went here first in 2013. Uh, we actually took Graham Hancock there for the first time to Turkey to see this in Quebec and Tepe. <coughs> he didn't mention this in his book though, did he, Andrew? Oh, God. But this is a huge polygonal wall. Um, and this is actually Hattusa, this is Elijah Hoyak. But there's an earlier culture called the Hattians in this area who were like a more goddess worshipping culture. And they were very, very influential in the area it seems like they may have been involved in the construction of this and not necessarily the Hittites but they could have been certainly influenced the Hittites but the fact you find the polygonal walls in the center of Turkey is fascinating in its own right um, and we'll be going here definitely you know, this is always on our agenda we'll be going here in October we're doing a, we're doing a trip out there me and Andrew and JJ um, and it's just it's, it's wonderful it's a wonderful place I absolutely love this place this is Hattusa with the great lions like the sphinxes guarding the entrance and here's Mr. Hancock himself, <laughs> just posing next to the wall. Amazing place. And of course, giants. Giants, giants. I've been found around this area. This one is <coughs> only seven foot one inch tall. 
So I've been chatting with a few people through this trip about the Olmec. I'm going to just jump around a few different subjects here. You can just tell me to stop whatever I to stop. And, um, but this is something that keeps coming up. It's connected with Egypt very strongly. There's more and more research coming up. JJ and I have been researching it really deeply, looking at JJ's an expert on the ancient symbolism. And she's been noticing things when we've been in Egypt that are identical to what we see in Olmec land. I've been here several times. First, I went to this area in 2003, again in 2010, 2009, um, and a few more times since. And this is uh, one of the gentlemen, Ivan Van Sertman. That is a good pose. This guy is amazing. He's like this African scholar who's based in America. And he was the first, really, to push forward the idea that there was an African presence in the Americas. I've, got, I've read all his books, absolutely brilliant. Um, and they now call it the Z culture, XI culture. This is a big thing on the internet now, but it's not necessarily correct. But even when the first Olmec colossal heads were found, 17 have been found in total. The first discoverer was Smithsonian archaeologist called Matthew Sterling, who really was the first to kind of announce it to the world in the early 1950s. He said they're amazingly Negroid. That was his quote. Amazingly Negroid. And that is just fascinating in its own right. They were first discovered, the first one was discovered actually in the late 1800s, uh, near Tresa Potes. You can see the size of them. I mean, the biggest one is actually 40 tons. And these were made from very hard basalt from the Tuxla Mountains, at least 60 miles away from most sites. A few different areas of the quarries. We, we, we discovered a couple of the quarry sites on our last trip there. We, we did an extra extra week in Olmec land. Absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And we've got carbon dates going back to 1800 BC. This is from Tresipotes. This would have been at the base of the pyramid, kind of slotted in. There's like a long part behind him there. Again, you see the kind of Africans looking features. It's been compared very strongly to Mali, the Mali kind of features, uh, and the hair as well. And, uh, and you, can't really, you can't really ignore this. The more you look into this, the more you realize there's, there must be a connection. It's absolutely fascinating. And we see this here. See the similar similarities to um, supposedly the Egyptian god Osiris, and it's the way they're lying down, facing out. We have these crouching figures, very Egyptian headdress. And this was found at a place. I think I think this is El Azazel. This is actually an obscure Olmec site we got to visit, and we're going to like take you know we're going to take uh, when we do a tour there next. We're going to go to a couple of these really obscure sites because they're really off the beaten track. Uh, and we've got, we know we've got to know the landowners and even the politicians. Not, not, not. I think we ended up in the newspaper for some reason. They kind of follow us around. It's quite funny. Here's some of the Olmec stonework. We have this sort of emerging, shame and emerging from the rock. And some of the stonework here is equivalent quality of ancient Egypt. All of it. I mean, it's unbelievable because you're talking about extremely hard basalt. There's certain types of granite that they were working with there. And you can't really go to Mexico without seeing these. these are, and to me, they're the most important part of ancient Mexico. Uh, this was recently discovered in the early 1990s um, in San Lorenzo. You actually have to go to San Lorenzo. You have to, like, you have to go on a dirt track for a few miles, but it's totally cool. Just avoid the alligators and things like that. Um, but this has got this headdress here. And this is really interesting because these, this is something that JJ spotted. These are the same as a load of these iron ore beads that were found with holes. They found something like 40,000 of these iron ore beads with holes drilled in them. And it seems like his headdress is made from it. This is extremely magnetic. And we know that if you wear a magnetic headdress, it's been tested on this by various researchers. It can affect the pineal gland and other glands in the brain, give you altered states. So there could be a connection. And some of these actually on display, I forgot to put the photo in, I apologize. Um, so there's, there's lots more going on here than, than people realize. And there's more connections with Egypt. This is, these were the Atlanteans <coughs> down at the Terra Nueva, which is very near San Lorenzo. There's some other statues in the area. We managed to get access to this private museum. Um, and the Egyptian goddess Nut and uh, holding up the world. It's like you know, the classic Atlantean holding up the world. So we're getting the, you know, similar symbolism. Uh, but Ivan Van Sertimo is the guy to read up on here. This is actually the site called La Venta. This is really the only remaining public Olmec site. And this is what's left of the pyramid. You can see it's pretty big. It's been grown over now. These are uh, seated figures. 
museum there is very interesting. The whole site itself is like an energetic hotspot and it's sat in the middle of the coastal Cocos River, which came in from uh, the Gulf Coast. Um, same with San Lorenzo, that's kind of, it's almost like on an island in between uh, two parts of the river. And this is, it's just incredible. I mean, there's too much to talk about here, but this is probably the most impressive, one of the most impressive carvings. This was Monument 19 from La Venta. And you can see this sort of dragon, going all the way old serpent with plumes on. So it's like a plume serpent, Kessel Poetic could plant. Earliest depiction in the Americas of this, potentially. And um, this is the gentleman wearing some kind of space headgear. He's got something on his nose. Some people, Eric Von Daniken believes it's a breathing apparatus. And wearing this kind of man, holding this man bag, which is something that is found all over the world. Some of JJ and Jim Vieira and Graham Hancock and others have been researching. Uh, but here, it's just saying that the, uh, you know, potentially the earliest depiction in Central America of Cuckoo Plant of the Plume of Serpent. And there is a connection with Egypt with this particular statue. It's something that JJ spotted when we were here last time. We were here last October with Nassim Haraman and his crew. And um, and this is a, uh, something that JJ put together. One of a brilliant um, kind of um, work that she puts together. I mean, this is uh, this is it. This is the one from the Isis temple, which we're going to be going to. We'll point this out to you when we get there. Again, it's very similar. Circled by a, a kind of plumed flying serpent. We have this. Obviously, I'll make we have a couple of other examples. If JJ's the expert, she can talk to you about this. But this, the fact that this is here, it's almost identical to this, same iconography. So, is there a connection, or is it just a coincidence? You know, that's, that's the big question we have to ask when looking at these sites around the world. And yeah, more examples here. We've got. I mean. I don't think Andrew agrees with me, but there's, there's bags here. Jim Vieira is convinced they're man bags, just like a hand, whoever. This is uh, the Sumerians, obviously, you know, we find in the uh, Middle East. Obviously, Old MacLeod, never ever believe this. Where's this from, JJ? Is it Australia? Or is it Africa? I can't remember. But yeah, example, there are many examples of people have gone crazy about this, just about someone holding a bag. Uh, what was in the bag? That's the question. <coughs> bag of sweets, probably. So let's have a look at some giants. And there's not much physical evidence of skeletons in ancient Egypt of giants, but there's some really interesting research that's been done. It's circumstantial evidence, really. So this is just some of the things we're going to have a quick look at. This is the giant uh, finger, the mummified finger, which is ridiculously big. It's about this long. Uh, we've got giant artifacts in some English museums. We've got an account of 11 foot, 7 foot giants art all over Egypt and so on but anyone heard the research about the giants in the last week is there any people who kind of know nothing about it is it like do I need to can I give you a little bit of info this is this is the best graphic really for the North American work we've been doing myself and Jim Vieira and also Mike <coughs> Ewers and some other research Andrew as well we'll be, we put together this book a couple of years ago we did a six-part TV show based on it just in North America and we found giants ranging from you know seven foot all the way up to 18 feet tall skeletons. We've got a count, the academic record, we've got the actual Smithsonian books themselves, their academic journals from the late 1800s, the fifth and the twelfth annual report especially, have many accounts of seven to eight foot tall giants. We have uh, verified accounts of nine foot giants and so on and so forth. And these are just the graph of some of the highlights, even like some found from serpent mounds, famous sites up in New England at the megalithic sites up there. California, we've got examples going back 10,000 years old in Nevada and on the Catalina Island off the coast of California. La la la. There's so much going on, it's ridiculous. Um, it's just uh, about 10 of 1,500 newspaper and academic journal town and county history accounts we have. Um, yeah. So many. This is just a, this is actually an early map. We haven't put them all on. This is put, put together by Cecilia Hall. You can see it really, really gets intense around the Ohio area. That was like the hub of the giants. We're going to be going here actually in June. We're going to be going to Ohio. We're going to be speaking at the uh, Serpent Mound Summer Solstice event that's organised by Ross Hamilton, who's the number one world's leading giantologist. We actually called him the Godfather of Giantology. 
It's a new name. Uh, and Jeffrey Wilson's the organiser. We're going to be speaking there. JJ and I, hopefully. Jim's going to be coming <coughs> along. Uh, but this area here is, is Mound Central. There's like over 100,000 recorded mounds and earthworks, geometric, astronomical, all over this whole part of North America. We have megalithic sites up here. We have extremely ancient human remains going back to between 10 and 30,000 years down the Catalina Island and the Channel Islands and California coast. Vada, we have uh, Lovelock Cave and the red haired mummies who were cannibals. It's an amazing story, it's, it's obviously all in the book. Uh, we, really, we really analyze everything really carefully. This is um, from Egypt. This is, strangely, this, is, is that, this, this gentleman was only 6 foot 1.5 inches, which is pretty much how tall I am. So I don't often get called a giant, but he was a third dynasty pharaoh called Sanakt. Anyone can correct me if they like. Um, but he was five inches taller than the so-called robust Ramesses II, who was five, uh, it was like five foot four, five foot five or something. And it caused a media sensation. The reason it did, it was only like a year or so ago this came out, is because he had signs of acromegaly or gigantism. He wasn't an actual natural giant, but it created this whole thing. I was like, okay, this is interesting. So it kind of triggered me to look further into what else was going on in Egypt, because I heard some accounts of um, actual giants. There are archaic legends um, and Arabian legends that talk about giants building the Dasher pyramids, even the Great Pyramid as quoted by Manly P. Hall in one of his lectures that was recently rediscovered and put out online. Uh, it's actually his lecture, you can Google it, Atlantis and the Gods of Antiquity is the name of the lecture, it's on YouTube. And uh, as a quote from it, we are told that in the year 820 AD, uh, the great sultan and, and so forth, that it had been built, the great pyramid would be built by giants. And they were called the Shedai, superhuman beings. And within the pyramid and those pyramids, they had stored a great treasure beyond the knowledge of man. So this is a quote from Manly P. Hall talking about this bit. I looked into all these different Arabian legends. And uh, there are quite a few interesting things going on there. Uh, I feature, I don't know, did, I, did you all get the article I sent you before the tour? I sent you an article. Uh, oh, okay, make sure I get your emails and I'll send you that. Um, it's a two part article on ancientorigins.com. But we know um, the, the Arabians were around the pyramids during the 800s. They were the first people to really go in there, uh, around 832, I believe. Uh, the Shedai, um, it's, it's a big question mark who exactly they were. It could refer to Shadad bin Ad, which is the king of Ad, it's an Arabian king. It was believed to be the king of the Ra Arabian city of Aram of Pillars. Uh, he is often referred to as a giant. It could also be a different, it could be a misspelling of the, um, the Shemshu Hall, the followers of Horus. There's big question marks about that. But there's lots of different examples uh, in these Arabian tales. I've got, I've got all of them uh, put together and I'm going to put it in the article. There's the Book of Wonders from around 1000 uh, AD. There's lots of medieval lore about Egypt before the Great Flood, and that the people of Ad were giants. And, um, and there was a giant called Hajit, and then there was another one called Kofodrim, who was placed secrets in the pyramids of Dasher and other pyramids to imitate what had been done of old. And he founded, one of these giants founded the city of Dendera, which we've all been to. So we have these accounts and um, stories of giants going way back, you know, potentially they're talking about before the Great Flood. So what, you know, I'm just giving you a quick outline here, but I'll go into more detail in the article and there's links there which you can go and investigate further if you, uh, if you want to. It also talks about Nacreus, the first king of Egypt after the Flood, I don't know it's spelled N-A-Q-R-A-U-S. Um, and with his companions, I quote, built monuments, erected high towers, and executed the wonderful works, <coughs> while the city of Memphis was the work of a later set of giants who worked for King Mizraim, who was another giant. Even later still, it describes the work of more of these colossi, and it quote, Adim was a giant with insurmountable strength and the greatest of men. He ordered the quarrying of rocks and their transportation to build pyramids, as had been done in former times. So, we're seeing here that even though these were Arabian stories and legends, often there is some truth in them. So with this in mind, I kind of looked into early accounts, early excavation reports. And there's some interesting anomalies would pop up. This is actually from a burial from Saqqara. 
um, and this is um, one of the early uh, excavations in the early 1900s, I think 1930s, by Walter B. Emery. And, um, and he talks about, he believes that Asakawa, the disciples and followers of Horus, were actually buried there. That was one of his ideas. Um, and the anatomical remains of individuals of the quote, with bigger skulls and bills than the native population, were found there. So they found much more robust, taller people with thicker, larger skulls found buried at Saqqara. <coughs> that alone I find quite interesting. There's no um, um, description of the exact height, but strangely you do get this picture with our good friend Zahi Wise, who we had breakfast with the other day, almost. <laughs> almost. Um, and here we have like, probably kids, but you know, there's a slightly elongated skull gentleman here, apparently photographed at Saqqara. Now this is some, this is some uh, artwork from various uh, places around Egypt. But don't get me wrong, this is paintings on walls. This is not evidence of any giants. But you do get some strange little things here, like a little gentleman here, a big tall guy here, and so on and so forth. But even in the, according to Freddie Silver, I couldn't find the actual source of this. So I'll quote Freddie Silver on this. He has been studying the uh, Edfu building texts. He wrote, the advice to initiates in the temple of Edfu offers a glimpse as to what the builder gods may have looked like, since the initiates were instructed to stand up with the Ahau, gods who stand up, who measured nine cubits tall, and that's approximately 15 feet tall, or 4.6 meters. So according to Freddie Silver, he's a good friend of ours, a fellow researcher, he's claiming that 15 foot tall giants were described in the Edfu building texts. Even on the Nama palette, who's, um, was found out uh, near or in High Hierocompolis, which is a fascinating site I've been looking into recently. We'll see why in a moment. The first pharaoh, Menes or Nama, or the Scorpion King, there's different variations on this. This was found at that site, which was the original kind of um, capital of Egypt. And you can see here, now this is speculative, he's very tall compared to these other people. It's a brilliant iconography here as well, which JJ's been looking at. Also, when I went to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, I actually went there to look at, for the Scottish stone spheres. It's another bit of research I've been doing. And I found this, and I saw this case. I thought, that's interesting, this is like a boomerang here. This is, uh, this is from Hiram, Hiram Coppolis. Uh, we saw some, there are some examples in the Egyptian Museum and in the, I think in the British Museum. I didn't even notice this, it was so big, but apparently this is a fragment of one of these. This is a normal sized flint knife. This is like this part. Of, the, of a larger knife, which is probably like this big. And it was found buried under the foundations from the earliest phase of this particular site. And this is the same site that was supposedly um, lived in and possibly even built, some, some people say that, by the, by the king we mentioned earlier, Yusuf. Classic moon. Thank you. <laughs> that just shows you the size of it in my hand. My hands are like six inches above it. <coughs> So Hierocompolis is a very interesting site, and it's not really megalithic. We actually go by it, we actually go by it on the Nile cruise. Hopefully maybe we'll see it. It's a very tall mud brick construction. There's some stone work there. It, it, apparently, according to Professor Robert Temple, it's one of the earliest uh, stone work used in Egypt. Now this is obviously up for debate, but that's what he says, and he believes that's most certainly the case. It's not particularly advanced stone work, but it's certainly stonework anyway. These are, these are limestone mace heads that were found um, uh, supposedly of the first pharaoh or the Menes or Nama, the scorpion king and so forth. And these are, these are hugely oversized mace heads, much bigger than they should be. Just speculative, could be, um, could be giants. And this is another one, this is, Neken is actually a site within the whole Hierocompolis Hira area. This is another one, we, we went, I'm from Cambridge, I, I went home to Cambridge recently to go to a funeral, and um, this, which JJ and I decided to pop into the museum, the, the uh, archaeology museum in Cambridge, and we couldn't find there's a whole area on Hiram Compolis, couldn't believe it, and, and uh, there's another huge knife fragment, which is part of the original discovery. Now these are massive, I mean, this is, this is, it must have been ceremonial. And here we have it here, this is uh, discovered in 1899. And it was right next to the Nama, right near the Nama palette where that was found. That's just a description of the knife itself. So we're not sure what's going on here, but we do know that the great king 
of that area. Uh, wow. this, is, come on. Thank you. <laughs> this is actually the site itself. See, it's pretty huge. There is, and these are all the graves, and these are huge graves. Some of these are like 10 feet long. Here's a plan of the site. And this is where our favorite king was found. But the thing is, he was over eight feet tall. He was eight foot six, according to some accounts. And this is written down over 2,000 years ago. This has been recorded ever since as being at least that tall. He was five cubits and three palms high, which would be about eight English feet. But that, this is the short cubit. So if we look at the standard cubit, it would be at least eight foot six. Uh, if we use the royal cubit, he would be 14 feet, seven inches tall. So that's probably not the royal cubit they used to measure him. Um, but it just to show you that even, you know, and this, this is Robert Temple, when he put this in his book, Egyptian Dawn, he couldn't believe it himself. He was like, this can't be right. But he looked into it, he looked into all the other records, and found that the, all the accounts matched. The bones weren't there though. That's the problem. There were no bones to prove it. But this, you know, does that account for the moving of huge stones like this? Probably not but worth mentioning anyway. This is obviously um, the Assyrian. And interestingly, this is the Abydos king list, which, is, uh, which we pointed out when we were in Abydos in the city, the first temple. And he's been removed from this king list completely. Him and his uh, relations were removed from this list. They weren't ever put into it. They weren't considered for it, which is very strange. Why would they delete certain pharaohs? What happened there? Some political activity going on? I just find that intriguing why that would be the case. Because this is obviously from the 19th dynasty, it's much later. This is actually the Temple of Isis. This is, uh, I believe we're going to be going here. In 1881, I've not worked out who this is yet, but Professor Timmerman, I'm not sure exactly who he was, I've not been able to find. It sounds like he was more of an antiquarian than an archaeologist. Uh, he was exploring the ruins of the Temple of Isis. Um, and he opened a row of tombs in which a prehistoric race of giants had been buried. Many of them were, there were 60 or so, many of them were seven feet tall, and the largest was 11 feet one inch tall. So what do you make of that? I mean, where the skeletons are and who Professor Timberman was is a whole other story. But this appeared in about 10 different newspapers at the time, and it was all over the world. It caused a bit of a sensation, apparently, when that was found. Then we have the giant finger. This is very controversial. This is a discovery made by Gregor Spori. That's about uh, 100, 100 kilometers north of Cairo. Um, and he took these back in the 1980s. Um, he, didn't really, he didn't publish them for a few years though, so it was quite strange. He had to pay this former grave digger who had the, a whole load of artifacts he was trying to sell Gregor, but he said he wouldn't sell the finger. And they had to pay $300 just to see it, a photograph. And he examined it, they eventually took x-rays of it, and it looks like it's a real human finger, or someone with massive hands. Um, either way, um, and, and it's got bone in it, there's proper flesh, you know, and it's been properly mummified. And the, and the guy left a tantalizing clue that it was found near Giza 150 years ago. I'm saying exactly where, near Giza. It might be saying that, like it had been done properly. Uh, the nail was sort of still on it, it was a bit loose, things like this. And it was like kind of leathery and flesh-like. And, uh, and the x-ray just pretty much proved it was a human finger. This is interesting, this was just, this was just a couple of years ago actually. This is the cemetery called Fag El Gamus, the way, it means, yes, the, way, the way of the water buffalo. There's even a pyramid there which dates to 2500 BC. Uh, I believe this is, is this over in the Sinai, towards the Sinai somewhere? Where is the uh, It's the way of the wall, but uh, it's all in here. So. Yeah, between the, 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 the cemetery between the 1st and 7th century AD. But what they found was, um, there's, they, apparently they found a million mummies here. Now this is kind of strange, I think it's in the eastern desert or towards the Sinai. And, um, they now recalculate that to probably 80,000 or 10,000 or something like that. They're not too sure, but there's thousands of them buried deep in the ground. But one of them they found was seven foot two inches tall. And the funny thing was, rather than a royal burial, apparently whoever had buried him folded him in half and shoved him down a hole. So uh, he wasn't obviously of royal stock. But this is the pyramid of that area. 
and it's apparently it's 2500 BC, which is contemporary with the official dating of uh, the Great Pyramid and those on the Giza Plateau. Obviously, um, giant sarcophagi doesn't necessarily mean giant humans inside the sarcophagi, but these are kind of interesting. You probably stuck, a couple of you saw them at the Egyptian Museum. Yeah. Absolutely huge, some of them. And obviously, there's um, it doesn't necessarily mean anything that though, but you know, some researchers online have been telling me these had giants in them, and just no discussion, just telling me. Uh, Obviously, the Serapium is an interesting place we're going to be going to. Massive, uh, massive stone boxes here. I mean, uh, we've already mentioned by Yusef, who's done some research on it. That apparently, one of them had an Apis bull mummy inside it. Apparently, one of them. Went, this is this is a report. I haven't seen it myself or anything like that. Uh, but the rest of them didn't, and some of them, I believe, were sealed still. Is that correct? Or they one. Okay. And uh, I mean, these are outrageous. So there's speculation within the Giantology community, if you can call it that, that there were humans in here as well. But highly, probably unlikely, but interesting anomaly because of the size of them, nonetheless. These are actually from the Osiris shaft, which some of us are going to be um, jumping down in a few days' time. Um, and these are huge as well, outrageously big, apparently. Um, I've not been down there myself yet. This will be my first time as well. Um, but apparently some of these are just so outrageously big, um, it um, you know, beggars belief. This is actually the uh, sarcophagus of Seti I. And this got, as you probably saw if you went to the Seti I tomb, it wasn't there. It's because it's in London, it's in the Soane Museum in London, a private museum. Um, a collector, uh, antiquarian, he collected you can see the kind of stuff he's got in this amazing place. Me and JJ went there a couple of months ago. It's nine foot four inches long. It's made of alabaster. It's got beautiful carvings on it. We're not allowed to photograph it or film it. We did. Uh, but this is, I prefer this old picture because it was in a glass case covered in dust. You couldn't really get a good shot. But this is a fantastic illustration, antiquarian illustration of it. Now it's nine foot four inches long. So, oh, every, all the giantologists got excited thinking it was. He must have been on nine foot tall or something like that. Actually, he was five foot seven. So that kind of put a spanner in the works on that one. And this is just a selection, uh, more detail of some of the photos uh, from a researcher friend of mine. He sent me a bunch of these. They're all online as well. You can see them for yourself. And you just see, you know, he's kind of claiming that that's a normal sized human and these are giants and things like this. You kind of see the examples. So some of them are compelling. They don't give any proof, but at least they're kind of um, depicted as such. More examples here. With giraffes, for some reason. Yeah, interesting, but, you know. Yeah, and he's kind of put these together. Uh, I think it's Mohammed Ado or something, his name. Um, Claiming that, you know, if you analyze it, it's, it's, these are the cases, these are the pyramid stones, but probably not. But even in earlier depictions as well, we have, you know, this kind of thing in the deserts of ancient Egypt, Sudan, and so forth, down the far south. How long have I got? It's currently 5 to 12, so. A little if, while longer. If you have, how much longer do you have? Maybe a short break? Two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I've got a like, ridiculous amount. No, not too many, actually. I'll I, I just, just... Do you want to finish it up? Ten minutes or something? Yeah, no, yeah. Okay, I mean, I'll just keep going if people want. I've taken a, some caffeine. Um, <laughs> this is... This is well, some of us are going to be going here to Baalbek in Lebanon. Uh, a few of us are going to be going there. I'm, I'm very excited about this. Yusef's coming now as well, of course, which is... Excellent news. I wrote an article about Baalbek for Atlantis Rising magazine a year or so ago, um, uh, which Andrew was commissioned to do, but he couldn't do it, so I, I did it. Um, and some of Andrew's research is in the article as well, but it's, this is an outrageous place. Obviously, several of you have been there already. Um, there, are, there is a tradition, uh, a Maronite patriarch of Lebanon, who states that tradition states that the fortress of Baalbek is the most ancient building in the world. Cain, the son of Adam, built it in the year 133 of the creation during a fit of raving madness. He gave it the name 
of his son Enoch, and peopled it with giants who were punished for their iniquities by the flood. That's the story. That's one of the ancient traditions relating to Baalbek. Um, obviously, it's connected with Egypt. There's something that uh, uh, Yusuf's going to be sharing with us when we go there. You know, the name of it was Heliopolis, like in ancient Egypt. Interestingly, as I mentioned earlier, the giant king. Passes more. Thank you. A statue was found in Byblos, this is the capital of Lebanon, so there's a connection there, the cedarwood boats and so forth. Um, but you know, obviously the, the stonework there has made people question that it was indeed built by giants. There was uh, this Phoenician histories, uh, talk about gods and demigods such as Thoth and Cronus being involved in the construction. This is actually the quarry. Uh, I know some of you have seen this already. This is like this is the new stone that's been discovered a couple of years ago. It's not my phone, is it? And this is the, the classic stone in the quarry. This is the one that's been found underneath it, and there's even, probably even more going on beneath it as well. And we're talking like ridiculous sized stones. Uh, this one's supposedly 1,674 tons, which would most certainly make it the largest uh, quarried stone in the world. There's debates, there's these ones in China, which supposedly are bigger, but I'm not too sure about that. I don't really think they are. There's another shot of it here. And this whole area is rich in giant lore. And, you know, Baalbek is attributed to various giants, as we've already mentioned. But this whole area, all these purple humans here, these are all giant accounts which have emerged and been, have been analysed and put together by Cecilia Hall, a colleague giantologist. And within the Bible itself, obviously, this is also related to Egypt. There's two, I'm not going to read this out or anything, but we've got things like King Og of Bashan, who was extremely tall. We've got uh, the famous story of David and Goliath, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and so forth, all talking about almost matter of fact giants all through the Bible lands. You can, I, can, I can send people uh, a lecture I've done about specifically about all this. These are some of the accounts uh, talking about giant skeletons that have been actually uncovered in Palestine, uh, Israel, uh, obviously David and Goliath. They even found proof that Goliath existed by finding his name carved on this artifact. Uh, this was just a few years ago. So things like that really, really, really intrigue me. I'm just going to skip a couple here. Uh, let me see what I've got. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've probably got time for this actually. I'll just go through this quick. Yeah, now one of the things we kept seeing, this is completely nothing to do probably with giants, but the Keystone Cuts is one of them weird things that quite a few researchers have picked up on, but I just wanted to mention this to you because we've actually seen a bunch of them and we're going to see a few more. This is from uh, Dendera. This is from uh, the Egyptian Museum. I forget which site this is from. Abusir. Abusir, yep. Yeah. And this is from, um, on the left here, actually, strangely, that's from the Assyria. Obviously, one, one part here, this is from uh, Abydos, outside the front of Abydos. There's some nice shots of a couple of us. You've been here before? Uh, what is this? <laughs> but interestingly, one of the weird things that I just uh, I was researching like yesterday, these were found at Abydos. And these are what goes inside the Keystone Cuts, the cramps or the clamps, different names for them. These are on display apparently at the Ashmolean Museum, but I didn't see them when I went there, so someone sent me these. And strangely, the name, apparently, if you want to check this, you said, Seti the first name is on them. And these were found in the large stones in Abydos. So this is like, put, this made me think about this, hang on a sec. So why would he put his name on them? Uh, you know, did, were they originally in there? And would they have lasted that long anyway? Or were they, were they metal clamps like we find in Tiwanaku and Pumapunku? And then they got stolen and then he put his own ones in there when he discovered it. So there's different ideas about this. But the fact is, these have been found and they do have Seti the first name on who was supposedly the builder. Officially, according to Egyptologists of the Assyrian and of obviously the Seti the first temple at Abydos. So this is, this is, we need to look more into this, I think, but this is kind of... Were they found inside the Assyrian or outside? Apparently in the Assyrian, inside... Inside some, the in, stones? Yeah, inside the stones. But that's, to me, that's been exposed for a while, so it's mm -hmm. hard to know 
why would he put his name on them? Is it like trying to claim ownership of it, or I don't know. It's, yeah, that's yeah. what that's what it seems like. It seemed a bit wrong, but I was talking to this this Egyptologist online last night who sent me those. Um, is Andrew being very spiritual? Um, and here we have uh, this is from Dendera, I think. We have this I, find, I found interesting. I'm not sure if that's a clamp there. Obviously, we have the classic bow tie clamps there. Interestingly very similar ones. This is actually a Puma Punku, one of the water channels of the main pyramid at Puma Punku. These definitely had metal in them because we actually see them on display at the museum there. This is from uh, Oyente Tambo in Peru and this is some of the actual metal that was found but we, we do know that in ancient Egypt iron was known to have been used, meteoric iron, stuff that came down from the sky and it was used. They found a 5,000 year old tomb and they found some beads uh, which were made of iron from meteors. So we know 5,000 years ago they were working metals. We also know that even before that, in different parts of the world, up to eight or 9,000 years ago, they were using copper. We know that from the copper mines up in um, the Great Lakes of Canada and North America. Um, so we know they were beating copper back then and creating stuff. And the copper actually in Egypt, uh, according to what I was reading uh, just a few days ago, is high in arsenic content. So that makes it a harder type of copper. So that could have easily been used inside some of these keystone cuts in some of the sites. Obviously we find it all over the world. There's some examples, I'm just borrowing this uh, from the internet. All over the world, it's too many to mention. There's like France even, Angkor Wat, Cambodia, Italy, uh, and so forth. There's actually some uh, from Cambodia here. This is from Priya over here, and, uh, and they're also at um, uh, and Cornwall itself, obviously. And this is actually a Roman construction, this pyramid, strangely. Uh, but look, this, the Romans were still using them as well. Probably wood or stone inside them, which is not necessarily metal in all of them. There was, they, I mean, the Egyptians, we know, did use wood, and then they put water in it to expand it and hold it together. But this is in, this is in Italy, in the Roman construction. So the, so the continuation of the technology was being used back then. So, um, Probably have to finish up in a second. Let's just see what else I've got here. Okay. Yeah, finish up in a second. But there's just a couple of things. I mean, just you know, we're looking at comparisons and things around the world. It's part of an article I wrote. Uh, I mean, Quebecly Tepe. I'm going to let Andrew talk about that, but it's possibly the most important archaeological site in the world at the moment. They've just built a new roof. It's just open. Um, very important. This is from Gebekli Tepe, so is this. However, these are not. These are from Silistani in Peru, and that's from Katimbo in Peru. Almost identical style we see in both sides of the world. And we have even this emerging from the belly. This is actually Costa Rica where the stone spheres were found. This is actually this totem pole in Gebekli Tepe. This is Katimbo. I was going to throw a few uh, images at you and then we'll, we'll finish up. Obviously the H, if you read it, it's H-U, spells U, yes. <laughs> we've got the H there, we've got the little serpents here, H blocks, la di da, I'm not sure about that if there's a connection, but we're throwing in there. But the serpents that we know are everywhere. Uh, this is actually from Saqqara. Oh no, sorry, this one's from Saqqara. This is actually from the Museum of Saqqara. This is from Gebekli Tepe. There's many more examples there. And this is actually from Gigantia or Gigantia on Gozo, on the Maltese island of Gozo. So we're seeing the same kind of things in different areas again. And almost the same style, the same design, not just the serpents, you know. So um, we have to, I mean, we, what to conclude of all this? I don't really know. I mean, there's so many different things we could we could explore here, we could speculate as to what this all means. Um, but, you know, the really, it does seem like, I mean, I think most of us will agree that's why we're on this tour. We're all megalithomaniacs, we all want to explore. We all want to kind of work out what's going on around the world. So uh, I'm really grateful to be on this tour, Patricia and Youssef and all the others, and Andrew and others. It's been, you know, I'm having a fantastic time and I'm sure it'll get even better. So thank you very much for listening. Questions, or do you want to stop? There's tons. <laughs> <laughs> well, Margaret, if I could. Yes, please. Um, is there any theories about the purpose of the Batman bags? That's 
You want to talk to JJ about that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Grab a conversation with her. She's, right. she's the expert on that. Yes. Have you encountered reports of forensic anthropologists studying the giant skeletons to see if they had signs of growth that was too rapid or like breakdown from the structure like we see in? Okay. Yeah. Good, yeah. Good question. So, lady asking about the. Um, you know, acromegaly, gigantism, the bones. Apparently not. In North America, it, it's very rare in the giant skeletons, because this was known about quite a long time ago, when they were digging them up out of mounds. Uh, very, very rare. So no, not really. But in more modern times, yes, there is more of that. I mean, there were some accounts, I know there's one in California, and a couple of others, but strangely, they're, they were robust. They are the same kind of, um, you know, dimensions as normal humans, just much bigger. Some of the jaws, though, were strangely large and massive. They, were called the, they ended up being called the Adena jaw. They were huge. We have a whole section called the Adena jaw in the book. Um, and then you start realizing it's not just that, it's around the world. You have the same robust, kind of different types, you know, really powerful type humans. I mean, maybe Andrew's going to show a picture of the, what's his name? Uh, the, the, the wrestler guy who's like oh, yeah, nine yeah, foot yeah, tall yeah. or something. Oh, like later, later. But, but, the, but some of these are like really like, you know, even today you have some people who just who don't have acromegaly and they're extremely powerful. And they have this sort of, you know, I mean, all, some of the American presidents witnessed live giants in the 17, 1800s and were amazed by how regal they were. They used the term regal and royal when they were describing their stature, the way they presented themselves, the way they stood. And they were seven, seven and a half feet tall. So, uh, and that was a standard size for some of these tribes, some of, especially the elite within the tribes, who usually bred between themselves, and kept the elite genes flowing through. We talk about that in the book, obviously. Yeah. Um, going back to uh, that uh, illustration you had of the Becker Hagen's pantry grid system. Yeah. Um, how many degrees apart were the longitudes on that? Because I saw they didn't quite correspond with the contemporary ones. But it, I mean, it's such a compelling pattern. Well, you can have, have a little look at the book I've got here. I've got it all in there, but this is what you're looking at, isn't it? Um, no, no, the, um, oh, the crisscrossy thing. Uh, the, uh, a bit more. Keep going. Are oh, you talking about the grid? Yeah, yeah. The actual grid itself. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. That one there. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I mean, this, this is this isn't necessarily based upon uh, the harmonic number, you know, the pentagonal or uh, processional numbers. This is like a kind of like a formula, like a grid system put together by William Beth and Becker and Beck, Beth Hagens, based upon all the different platonic solids. Specifically, it became if you actually put it into a sphere, it becomes what's called a rhombic triacontahedron. Okay. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but that's it's like a, it's almost like a puffed out version of an icos or dodecahedron uh, nest, nesting within with an icos or dodeca nesting within themselves. The points touch the center of the uh, faces of each one, and then you puff it out like a, it's almost like blow air into it. Puff it out, and it creates makes it more three D. And that becomes a rhombic tyrocontahedron. And this is what this is based on. It makes sense. It's logical. It's based basically on Buckminster Fuller's Synergistics 2. You know about that. Have you got that in your yeah, book? Yeah, it's in a little book there, yeah. 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 I've looked, me and Andrew have been looking at photos of that, trying to work it out, and it, it's compelling, but it's a bit like um, the Bosnian pyramids, not too sure, probably not. Um, and it's like, weirdly though, there are some photos where they're kind of resting on the ground, they're not just coming out of the ground, but you do get natural formations like that, you do get natural things. I've, I've seen them myself, but I thought they were like megalithic. I can't really give, I don't really know, but um, uh, it'd be good for someone to go there and actually get some shots of that and do some analysis. Okay. What's the name of the king? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to finish now. Um, <laughs> oh, Patricia. Right. Patricia. Uh, quick announcement. We have lunch today at 1 o'clock, so you have a chance to run up on deck if you like. Do whatever you want. Uh, at 1.30, Yosef would like everybody up on the top deck if you'd like to see Cecilia, uh, the quarry, sandstone, sandstone quarries. 
Uh, we saw a lot of, um, uh, well, it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Can go up and see that we're going to be passing by at around 1 okay. When you're done lunch, if you just want to go up. Um, when and is, then we'll have two o'clock lecture with Andrew Collins. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, you. I look forward to seeing you then.